Uh, today, Austria is a quite small and unimportant country in the middle of uh, Europe, which many people uh, outside the old world can't locate exactly, or even worse, they confuse it with Australia. Uh, the reason for the manageable size of uh, this country today is the result of World War I, which our emperor, Franz Joseph, and his uh, uh, successor, Karl, lost by, side by side with their brother in arms, um, William II from Germany. Austria has been for many centuries, as uh, Rahim already mentioned today, the eastern frontier of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. Uh, and this ended ingloriously in 1806 when Emperor Franz II from the House of Habsburg laid down the crown in the wake of military disasters fighting against Napoleon Bonaparte's troops. The role as a frontier against, for instance, Huns and Turks, certainly influenced the character of the Austrians, at least of those of them who lived in the east of the country and near the borders. Georges Clemenceau was uh, the French prime minister who led the peace negoti negotiations regarding Austria in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, which has been signed in September 1919. There is, in fact, no reliable proof if we really spoke out these informal words, which I took as a title for my speech, The Rest is Austria. He addressed the new borders of the country after its defeat in the World War I. However, the outcome was a treaty, which in fact turned out to be a dictate like the Treaty of Versailles with Germany. Nevertheless, it must be said, that the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire was not the result of Allied or French demands. The collapse of the empire rather began as soon as the guns became silent. The empire had qu quite honestly lost its meaning, particularly for the Slavic uh, peoples, who considered it a Völkerkerker, a pe people's prison. Be that as it may, the result was exactly that of the quote of Clemenceau. Austria from now on was and is the wimpy rest of a formerly respectable empire. You can call it whatever you like, but the meaning of Clemenceau's words was more or less a modern, modern version of the verdict vae victis from ancient Roman times. And this was exactly how the remaining German Austrians perceived it. In a certain way, the incidents, which date back now 100 years, have not completely lost their relevance for the Austrian mentality until today. To give you an idea what tremendous impact the result of the disastrous defeat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire to the self-conception of the remaining Austrians had, I'll present you two maps before and after the war. This is the situation before the war. You see the both halves of the, of the dual empire. This is the Austrian one, and this is the Hungarian one. Uh, and uh, Hans -Pet Karl Peter already mentioned the names Cisleitanian and Translitanian for the two halves. And this goes back to a small river here in this area who divides the both parts of the empire from each other. I do not bore you with the different names of the, of the, provi of the different provinces, just uh, because uh, the name of Ludwig von Mises has, has been mentioned a few, a few times today already. Here is Lemberg. His, this is the city of his birth. You see, the, 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 the Lemberg is as, as far away from Vienna as St. Gallen is. So it's, it has been a quite, quite huge dimension. Here in the south, which is here called Königreich der Serben, Kroaten and Slovenen. This part was Bosnia Herzegovina. And this Bosnia Herzegovina has been formerly part of the Ottoman Empire and has been annexed by the Austrian Empire in 1908. This caused a political crisis, a severe political crisis in the first place, and emerged 
as a fatal error later on. It finally led, sorry, this is the wrong direction. It finally led to the Urkatastrophe des 20. Jahrhunderts, the basic debacle of the century, as some historians called it, when the heir to the crown, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in Sarajevo, the Bosnian capital, by a Serbian nationalist. As you all probably know, this political murder became the casus belli which initiated World War I. And now this is the situation, actually. The red, uh, it's just by chance, uh, by, by, by incidence, that's it's red. Uh, you see the dramatic change to the former situation. And uh, this is, uh, uh, this is um, how the figures look like. Austria before and after the war. The population before the war was roughly 51.5 million and after the war, and uh, long time uh, past that, uh, 6.4 million. The territory was in 1914, 676,000 roughly square kilometers, and today it's uh, 84 square kilometers. Both figures down 87.5%. Uh, just for the sake of comparison, the, Germany, uh, the Germans lost just 13% of their territory due to the dictate, oh, sorry, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles and 7% uh, of their population. To complete the picture, uh, the Treaty of Trianon, signed by June the 4th in 1920, sealed the fate of the Hungarian half of the empire. Hungary roughly lost two-thirds of its territory. To repeat, nearly 90% of both Austria, ter Austrian territory and population was lost. Whereas the biggest losses of territories related to the Slavic part, there was also a painful deprivation of German territories, for instance, the southern part of Tyrol, which became the prey of the defaulting Italians. By May 1915, they declared war on the Austrian Empire, their former confederate at the beginning of the war. Let me come now to the history of the First Republic. By the end of the war, for most of uh, Austrians, the old world, which they were familiar with, broke into parts and disappeared completely. Everything the people have learned from their parents, grandparents, and teachers lost its meaning and became obsoletely from one moment to the other. Emperor Karl was forced to leave the country. He went to, into exile in Madeira, where he died in Funchal in April of 1922, and Austria became a republic by November 1918. Not even a single one of the political, already existing political parties in the country, be it left, left or wrong, believed in the survivability of this small rest state. After all, you have to take into consideration that the big proportion of the industrial and the agricultural basis, which was located in Bohemia and Moravia, partly in Hungary, was lost. Furthermore, Austria became a landlocked state due to the loss of Trieste and the coast of Croatia. Hence, a broad majority of the people was keen to unite with the ten times bigger second uh, German state, namely Germany, the German newly formed republic. This because on one hand, the liberals and conservatives could not imagine that Austria as a state could survive on its own. And on the other hand, the social democrats in addition were convinced that Germany would become a socialist state. An unmistakable expression of the Austrian desire for a unification with Germany was the self-selected name Deutsch Österreich, German Austria. But in vain, because the victors of the war categorically prohibited both the use of the name German Austria, as well as any attempt to unify with Germany. Hence, Austria had to stand on its own feet and muddle through, which it did more, rather worse than better. The first parliamentary session after 
after the war took place in November 1918, when 208 representatives of the former Reichsrat, this was the parliament in the time of the monarchy, met. 65 of them uh, Christian social, 37 social democratic, and 106 German nationalist and liberal. Liberal in the European sense, not in the American one. Some conservative and liberal contemporaries feared an attempt of left-wing radicals to try a communist revolution. Hence, despite the fact that the liberals and conservatives held a significant majority in the parliament, they elected the social democrat Karl Renner as the first chancellor of the republic. The politically moderate Karl Renner seemed as a man who was able to keep the radicals in his party calm and under control, which was in fact the truth. It's an interesting detail that just the farmers were the most important representatives of liberal ideas because they were not interested in boss, uh, be bossed around by civil servants and just wanted to be left alone by the government. But as soon as they wanted to protect their products from foreign competition, the liberal plantlet withered quickly. So the number of liberals and nationalists shrunk and the Catholic conservative Christian socials as well as the Marxist social democrats remained as the main political powers. It was not before 1920 when the country got a democratic constitution mostly written by Hans Kelsen, a social democrat and legal positivist, but anyway a friend and even marriage witness of Ludwig von Mises. This basic law is still valid and it's one of the oldest constitutions in Europe. In the early 1920s, Austria suffered from a severe inflation crisis which ruined a big part of the bourgeoisie and caused mass employment. The economic crisis led to a radicalization of the political parties, which more and more began to consider their competitors not as rivals but as enemies. Hence, both Social Democrats and the Christian soldiers built up their own armed militia, which regarding the headcount, outmatched the regular military forces of the country by far. Due to the priest treaty of Saint-Germain, the Austrian military forces were limited to a headcount of 30,000, a number which have never been re reached until the Anschluss, the occupation by the German Reich in 1938. Just to give you a figure, in 1928, the socialist militia called Republikanischer Schutzbund, Republican Protection League, commanded some 80,000 men. The Christian Social Heimwehr, Home Defense League, was of similar strength. The state lost its monopoly of violence, and the political struggle, struggle went from the House of Parliament to the streets. It's worthwhile to have a look at the dazzling personality of Otto Bauer, leader and mastermind of the Austrian Social Democrats, which called themselves Sozialdemokratische Arbeiterpartei, Social Democrat Workers' Party, abbreviated SDAP. Bauer was, like Viktor Adler, the founder of the Socialist Party of Jewish ancestry. He studied law at the University in Vienna and attended lectures given, amongst others, by Eugen Bühn von Bawerk and Friedrich von Wieser. Ludwig von Mises, Otto Neurath and Josef Schumpeter were his fellow students. In 1900, he joined the SDAP and began his political engagement. During his studies, he became a friend of Max Adler and Karl Renner, and together with them, he founded the Association Future, the nucleus of what later on has been called the Austro-Marxism. In 1926, the Linzer program of the SDAP was presented, which was mostly written by Otto Bauer. In his public speeches, he openly demonstrated sympathy for a socialist revolution and praised the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was obviously a tactical mistake because the Christian socials and the liberal and conservative press used this verbal aggressiveness against him. 
Otto Bauer, Otto Bauer's uh, friend, Ludwig von Mises later claimed that he could convince him in a series of private debates to stay away from revolution and keep to the pathway of um, social reforms and democracy. It's for sure that the big majority of the people in Austria did not want to follow the Soviet example. In so far, Bauer's radical rhetoric was certainly counterproductive for his party and his goals. Nevertheless, Marxism is still alive in Austria, as well as elsewhere, and until the 1970s, students chanted, Demokratie, das ist nicht viel, Sozialismus, das ist das Ziel. Democrat, democracy ain't much, socialism is the goal. And wir wollen die volle Diktatur des Proletariats. We want the full dictatorship of the proletariat. In the meantime, the Austrian Reds have become more moderate, or more precisely, they try hard to give themselves at least a moderate look. Some historians consider a fatal incident in 1927 as the turning point on the Austrian way to a totalitarian state. To keep things short, in the small village Schattendorf, in the southeast of, of the country, a confrontation between rivaling party armies, right-wing Frontkämpfer on one side and Red Schutzbund militia on the other hand, on the other side, could not be prevented by the police. Two persons of the raids were shot dead, and five others insured. When the jury in the following criminal process declared a verdict of not guilty for the presumed perpetrators, this was recognized an outrageous scandal by the socialists and led to the arson of the, uh, of the Palace of Justice and to violent demonstrations. The police shot dead 89 protesters and suffered five fatalities of its own personnel. The political climate from this moment on for the whole country were, was embittered totally. Regarding the Schandurteil von Schattendorf, the verdict of shame, as the Reds called it, it's important to know that geschworenen Gerichte, trials by jury, were a relatively new thing at the time. They had just been introduced in the early 1920s. To bring it to the point, there was practically no routine uh, to practice this kind of court procedures. In the special case of uh, the Schattendorf trial, the jury may have simply been overwhelmed by the task. Today, with the chronological distance of many decades, it seems that on the basis of the available information at this time, the jury can, came to a correct decision. Two times, in 1931 and 1932, Otto Bauer refused to join a coalition with the Christian Socials, which was later considered a serious mistake. At this very moment, so the opinion of some historians, democracy in Austria could possibly have been saved. As a result of a tactical mistake, during a parliamentary session on the 4th of March in 1933, Engelbert Dollfuss, the Christian soldier chancellor at the time, could land a coup d'etat, power down the parliament, and subsequently ruled the country by Notverordnungen, emergency decrees, a legal instrument that dated back to the Kriegswirtschaftliches Ermächtigungsgesetz, the War Economic Enabling Act of 1917. A few words to this nickname. Prince Clemens Wenzel Lothar von Metternich was the organizer of the Viennese Congress in 1815. He was the mastermind of the restoration in, Ost in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars and fought, like Dollfuss did, with repressive methods against the liberal and nationalistic forces, especially in Germany and Italy. This historic parallel and his body height of just 151 centimeter led to his alias Milli Metternich. It's important to note that at the same time, in 1933, Adolf Hitler became ch Chancellor of Germany. In the, right, in the light of this, it appears quite strange that Otto Bauer still declared Habsburg a danger to Austria, a danger not smaller than Hitler. On the other hand, Dollfuss, was, who was strictly Catholic, bared strong sympathies for the Italian-style fascism, as well as the Italian leader Benito Mussolini, and abhorred both 
the German national socialism as well as a pluralistic democracy. He tried to win Italy as the protecting power of Austria. By November 1933, after a failed assault on Engelbert Dollfuss, who had just been slightly injured, his regime, his, his regime introduced martial law trials with death penalty. Furthermore, Dollfuss systematically disabled, disabled the opposition. He not only banned the social democrats, their newspapers and their militia, but also the growing Austrian branch of the NSDAP, the Austrian National Socialists, and the small communist party. Whether you call the result a fascist state or a Catholic stand state is a question of taste. From a libertarian standpoint, it's anyway out of the question. On the basis of growing political tensions, a police action against illegally armed men of the Red Schutzbund in the city of Linz in Upper Austria, which took place on the 12th of February 1934, initiated an ill-prepared revolt against the government, which resulted in a nasty bloodshed. It's in the eye of the beholder if you call this episode an uprising or a civil war. However, Austrian military forces laid siege on some of the strongholds of the so-called Democrats, most of them the infamous Gemeindebauten. You see here one of them, the biggest one, it's the Karl Marxhof, with, which is still alive. Uh, municipal buildings in Vienna. Vienna, you have to take into consideration, was and still is undisputed, in, undisputed in the hands of the Reds since 1919. If you look at, of, at that kind of buildings, which have been strategically spread over the whole city, you cannot help thinking that they have been constructed according to plan as fortifications for the civil war, which has already been taken in prospect by the Reds. It only took four, four days to crush the uprising, which ended in the fourth day by March the 15th. The figures, the, sorry, the fights cost 300 fatalities, 200 civilians, and 100 police officers, and 800 casualties. As the Austrian historian Gudula Walterskirchen in her recently published book, Die Blinden Flecken der Geschichte, The Blind Spots of History, wrote, the military forces did not use sharp grenades when they shelled municipal buildings like the Karl Marxhof, but, uh, but practice ammunition. It was not their purpose to bomb the red fortification to the ground, but just to frighten the rebels and demonstrate them the absolute helplessness of their attempt. This explains the relatively low number of casualties on the side of rebels. After the uprising, 24 of them were sentenced to death by court marshals. Only nine of them were really executed. The socialist leader Otto Bauer went to exile in Bohemia and later on to France, where he tried to support the socialist back, uh, underground opposition in Austria. He died in Paris due to a heart attack in 1938. Just to complete the picture, this is the Karl Marx Hof I showed you during the uprising in 34. Um, the building, as well as its name, is a symbol of the crimson history of the city of Vienna, and at the same time, it's the biggest and undoubtedly one of the ugliest buildings in town. Socialists sent for the beautiful at its best. On July 25th, 1934, a bunch of members of the illegal NSDAP, the Austrian National Socialists, ventured an ill-prepared coup. The attempt was a complete failure, but nevertheless the rebels successfully stormed the office of the Federal Chancellor, where Otto Planeta, the leader of the operational command, shot dead Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss, who bleeded to death when the National Socialist Command refused medical rescue for him. After the suppression of, this, of the revolt, Planeta was sentenced to death by hanging, together with one of his accompanies, and executed just six days after the murder of Dolphus in July 1934. For the conservatives in Austria, Engelbert Dolphus became a marcher during his fight against the Nazis. For the Reds, he went down in history as a butcher of workers. He is subject of passionate 
political debates until today. The Parliamentary Club of the ÖVP, the Conservative Austrian People's Party, successor of the Christian Socials, Socials of the First Republic, only recently removed his portrait from the rooms of the Parliamentary Club under the pressure of political correctness. This is a picture uh, from the Heldenplatz, the Hero Square, uh, main, main uh, place in Vienna, uh, where the funeral service for the Chancellor has been done. And you see the crowd here, and you see this is a symbol for his popularity, at least in a part of the, of the population of Austria. Kurt Schuschnigg was the successor of Engelbert Dollfuss until 1938. His attempt to establish Austria as the better German state was foredoomed from the outset to th and throughout. He ruled the country with iron fist. Up to 16,000 political prisoners were detained in so-called Anhalte Lagern detention camps. The infamous 1000 Mark Sperre introduced by Adolf Hitler in May 1933 was a big blow for the Austrian economy, especially for the very important tourism branch. Germans traveling to Austria had to pay 1000 Reichsmark to the German state. Things got worse for Austria when the Italians, against the international law, invaded Ethiopia in 1935. Mussolini desperately needed an ally, which he found in Adolf Hitler. Italy from this moment on was no longer a reliable guarantor and backup for the authoritarian, authoritarian Austrian regime. This brought Schuschnigg under growing pressure of the German Reich. Furthermore, a growing proportion of Austrians enviously looked to the seemingly successful development of the German economy, while they still suffered mass employment and misery. Schuschnigg tried to flee to the front and come to better re relations with the other, the bigger German state. The Juli Abkommen, the July Treaty of 1936 between Austria and the German Reich was the result. Austria should loyally support the German foreign policy and interests, and Hitler promised not to interfere with internal matters in Austria and would not waste thoughts to occupy the country. This treaty is often seen as the first step to the end of the Austrian independency. Forbidden National Socialist newspapers could appear again from this moment on. On February, on the 12th of February 1938, Franz von Papen, the predecessor of Hitler as German Chancellor and now in the role of the German ambassador in Vienna, arranged a meeting between Hitler and Schuschnigg at the Oberseitsberg in Berchtesgaden. Hitler intimidated Schuschnigg and openly threatened with a military invasion. Hence, Schuschnigg saw himself forced to re-legalize the Austrian branch of the NSDAP. The so-called Berchtesgadener Abkommen cleared the way for the National Socialist Arthur Seiss Inquart to become Minister of the Interior on February the 16th of 1938. To save what could be saved, Schuschnigg announced the public opinion poll, which should take place on Sunday the 13th of March. Question was, do the people prefer a free, independent, social and Christian Austria or do they not? Hitler probably feared the result not in his favor and reacted immediately by mobilizing the troops of his 8th Army for an invasion of Austria. Schuschnigg cancelled the poll, but it was too late. He was forced to resign from his post. On the evening of the 11th of March, he held a legendary radio address. He declared that Austrian Germans would, under no, all circumstances, avoid to, jet, to shed German blood, which meant there would be no resistance by the Austrian army. And he ended with the words, the Herr Bundespräsident beauftragt mich dem österreichischen Volk mitzuteilen, dass wir der Gewalt weichen. Gott schütze Österreich. The President of the Republic instructs me to declare that will give way to force. May God bless Austria. On the 12th of March, 
1938, German troops successfully invaded Austria without firing a single shot. Three days later, Hitler held a welcome address at the Heldenplatz, the Hero Square, in Vienna. I showed you a similar picture at the funeral service of Dolfus. So you see the popularity of both of these men. Now Austria became a federal country of the German Reich called Ostmark. So 21 years after the end of World War I, Austria had become part of the German Third Reich and Austrian men wore German uniforms in World War II. They lost the war once more side by side with their German brothers in May 1945. At this very moment, the idea of Austria being a part of Germany died out immediately. This is not a, a, not a big surprise because the Moscow Declaration of 1943 called Austria, quote, the first victim of the German aggression policy, end quote, which turned to be a carte blanche after the war when the Austrians had not to feel as perpetrators, but as victims, which most of them did. Let me now come to the Austrian relations with its neighbors at the present time. We have eight neighbor states, and four out of them were successor states of the Austria, ah, successor states of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. It's the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Slovenia. To be exact, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia split up in 1993 out of Czechoslovakia and have, are now two uh, independent uh, states. All these uh, successor states of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire came under communist rule and became part of the so-called Ostblock, the Eastern Bloc. By far the most important of our neighbor states in every sense is Germany. It's the biggest commercial partner, but as the Austrian writer Karl Kraus put it, uh, uh, Rahim has already uh, quoted uh, the man, the quote is, we are separated by the same language. Not just since 1919, Austria and Germany share a common destiny. Little more with the next slide. The relations with Germany, it's a very special kind of love and hate relationship that ties these two countries together. Austrians today represent roughly one-tenth of the population of Germany. A lot of them cultivated and still have a kind of inferiority complex, at least starting in 1919, when the victors of the war, mainly the French, prevented Austria from building a political union with the newborn German Republic, as I already mentioned. Many Austrians consider Germany as the big brother in the West. They admire the economic efficiency and accuracy of the Germans, but they abhor their lack of humor, their haughtiness, their attitude always to come straight to the point, and the tactlessness, which many of them frequently show. Germans, on the other hand, consider the Austrians as a sloppy version of themselves. At least that's the feeling on the Austrian side. But for that, they appreciate Austrian hospitality and friendliness. The relationships between Austria and the two neutral states in the very West can not, other, not, not called others than very, very and absolutely friendly. The context to the other states, that means for, uh, for uh, for, for the um, successor states of the empire as well as uh, to Italy, are also friendly, but they are packed with a certain amount of feelings of superiority or even arrogance. A significant lead for this is, for instance, that a lot of Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians and Slovenians speak quite well German, whereas only very few Austrians speak one of their languages. As in Germany, you can find very little interest to keep busy with the languages of the neighboring states. Just a few words to the Austrian relations to the Russians. 
a brief retrospection. Austria has been occupied by the Allied forces after the war for 10 years, up to 1955. The eastern part of the country, as you can see, was occupied by the Soviets. Many people of my age have been told terrible stories by their parents and grandparents. Soviet violations against civilians, lootings and gang rapes frequently occurred. Hence, in the perception of the elder generations, the Russians remain as brutal barbarians. This picture has changed. Nowadays, a lot of wealthy Russians visit Austria as tourists and spend a lot of money there. Therefore, the young generation does not longer, longer observe the Russians as a menace. Rather, they see them as people with much money and often pretty bad manners. Ra uh, Austria, being a member of the European Union, is obliged to share its restraints of trade and the critical distance to the actual government. In addition, a few words to the Austrian relations to the Jews. Austria had a relatively big Jewish community, most of them secularistic, until 1938. When Hitler's troops invaded Austria, roughly 500,000 Jews lived in Germany. At the same time, some 200,000 Jews lived in Austria, which just has been one-tenth of the German population. Look at the relation. More than half of them left the country when the German, uh, Germans occupied Austria. They went to England, to the United States, to South America, as well as to Palestine. But roughly half of them stayed there. Most of them were deported to concentration camps and killed. Just 5,500 Jews survived the nationalist area within Austria. Today, the community consists of roughly 16,000 people. Homemade anti-Semitism does no longer matter. Instead, important anti-Semitism is a growing problem, as it is in some other European countries. Against all requirements of the political correctness, many Austrians are still using pejorative labelings for citizens of some of their neighbor states. Two of them hardly can be meaningfully translated or explained. One of them is Katzelmacher for the Italians who are still considered from some people as notorious tricksters, traitors and cowards. The word stems probably from the Roman word for kettle or tinkerer, or for a wooden dipper, which has often been handcrafted and sold by Italians. Another swear word used for people coming from the Balkans is chush, or here the pure plural chushen. Um, this may etymologically be uh, explained and it, uh, because it may, be st may stem from a Slavic term for here. Instead, Pivke, the unfriendly branding for our German neighbors, has a crystal clear history. As you possibly know, there was a struggle between Austria and Prussia regarding the leadership of the German Confederation in the, end of, or in the second half of the 19th century. This struggle resulted in the so-called German War in 1866. The Prussians decisively defeated the Austrian Northern Army in July this year near the city of Königgrätz, today Klum, in Bohemia. Bismarck, at this time, the Prussian Chancellor from 1871 on, the German one, could convince his king, Wilhelm I, not to hold a victory parade in Vienna, which would have been a nasty humiliation for the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph, which he, which he wanted, wanted to avoid. Instead, the Prussians held a parade in Gensendorf, a small village located in the north of Vienna. Johann Gottfried Piefke, a Prussian military musician, composed a victory march, the Königgrätzer March, which faced its first performance in that village where a lot of nosy Austrians, especially Viennese, watched the marching troops of the enemy. They recognized the name of the composer of the victory march, Piefke. From that moment on, the Prussians, and later after building the German Empire in 1871, the Germans were, were and still are called Piefkes, which is in fact not meant as flattery. 
For people outside Germany and Austria, it might be difficult to see any relevant difference because they have lived together for centuries and they speak the same language. To explain the difference between Germans and Austrians, it might be expedient to listen to the following musical examples. It's German military marches and Austrian military marches. If you listen to the German piece, it's Prussian's Glory, it's one of the most uh, famous. It's the same composer as for the Königgrätzer Marsch, it's uh, Johann Gottfried Piefke. You can imagine soldiers with spiked helmets marching precisely in goose steps. Just listen. Okay, this is now the Königgrätzer Marsch. No. Okay, so now, yeah. <laughs> ah. it's, it's a, I, I'm an Austrian, not I'm an Austrian, not a German. It's not so perfect. <laughs> I'm very sorry. So what I wanted to demonstrate, uh, unfortunately, doesn't work. The Florentina March, uh, composed by a man called Julius, named uh, Julius Fucic. It's a, just a detail, uh, maybe an interesting detail. Julius Fucic has been the commander of the musical military unit in Sarajevo when the uh, heir to the crown has been assassinated there. So just, uh, I, I cannot sing and I cannot dance. Uh, I just, uh, just give you a, um, uh, an explanation. This Florentina March has some other Austrian military marches does not really sound like a military march like the two examples I just showed you, but more than dance music, like dance music. That's maybe that marks the difference between the both countries. To come to a conclusion, basically, Austrians and Germans are united by their widespread, uncritical obedience of state control and their ability to get a revolution done and the king beheaded, like the English and the, English and the French did. But from my very individual point of view, Austrians and Germans are different in their degree of servility. It's for sure no coincidence that the Germans have always been the better soldiers than the Austrians because they never hesitated a second to do what they have been told by their commanders. In this respect, Austrians may in fact be a sloppy version of the Germans. We Austrians always fear a certain amount of serenity, rebelliousness and anarchism, which you rarely can find amongst Germans. On the contrary, it seems that Germans tend to make a crusade out of anything be it the Energiewende, the energy transition, which leads to deindustrialization, be it the irrational fight against the allegedly man-made climate change, which results in a deterioration of the important automotive industry, or the not questioned, obviously self-destruction migration policy with the German government tries to impose on all other European countries. The overbearing idea, am deutschen Wesen soll die Welt genießen, the world is supposed to recover on the German way, is still alive, like roughly 160 years ago when it came to birth. In contrast, we Austrians never had the illusion that the world could become a better place if she only copied or followed our paradigm. Being myself, a typical East, Austrian hybrid with both German and Hungarian bloods in my veins, I hopefully were able to give you a brief insight in my country's recent history and the Austrian mentality. Take it as an unchallengeable proof for the smartness of us Austrians that we have successfully transformed Mozart and Beethoven into Austrians and made Adolf Hitler and Ernst Kaltenbrunner Germans. Let me finish with a famous quotation of a brilliant compatriot of mine, Eric von Kühnelt-Ledin, which, uh, uh, who has already been quoted by, uh, by Rahim. It goes, right is right and left is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.